On the 20th of November 1968, the ground shook beneath the town of Farmington in West Virginia. Residents there immediately suspected that something had gone wrong at the nearby console number 9 coal mine. They headed there in droves and were confronted by the terrifying sight of the mine on fire, with clouds of smoke billowing into the air from its entrance. They were witnessing the Farmington Mine Disaster, one of the worst mine disasters ever to take place in West Virginia, and one that would forever change the face of the US mining industry. The US state of West Virginia is rich in coal, with coal deposits to be found in almost all of its 55 counties. Since 1810, humans have been extracting this coal on an ever-increasing scale. In the early 1800s, the coal was used mostly within West Virginia, in domestic settings and to help power the state's other industries, which included the production of salt and timber. In 1883, however, several major railway lines were opened in the area, allowing the coal mined from West Virginia to be exported across the country. As a result, the coal industry rapidly became a vital and valuable asset for the state. Lucrative though it might be, the process of retrieving coal from underground was very dangerous. Miners often suffered poor health as a result of working conditions, and many died in accidents. One of the greatest dangers in coal mining was gas. Pockets of gas underground could be extremely hazardous. A single spark would be enough to ignite a pocket of flammable methane gas, which could result in a massive explosion. In 1886, one such gas explosion killed 39 men and boys at the Mountain Brook shaft in Newburgh. This deadly explosion, and several others like it over the years, did not, however, slow down the growth of the mining industry. The console number 9 mine was situated just north of the small town of Farmington in the Pittsburgh coal seam, the largest and thickest coal bed in the Appalachian Basin. It opened in 1909 and was originally operated by the Jameson Coal and Coke Company, before later being purchased by the Consolidation Coal Company in 1956. The mine was vast, stretching over an area of around 35.4 square kilometres or 22 square miles. The original entrance shaft to the mine was around 98 metres or 322 feet deep and the mine was producing over 90,000 metric tonnes, or 100,000 short tonnes, of coal per year by 1911. By 1956, this already impressive output had risen to 1.1 million metric tonnes, or 1.2 million short tonnes per year. It was, safe to say, a very profitable mine. This growth came at a price, though. From the year the mine opened, workers complained about the hazards of working within it. Safety lamps were installed to make an explosion less likely. But nonetheless, in 1954, a gas explosion took place, killing 16 miners. An official report after this accident produced numerous recommendations intended to prevent similar disasters, including improving ventilation to prevent the buildup of explosive gases. On the morning of the 20th of November 1968, 99 workers were inside the console number 9 mine. They were spread across the mine, working in different areas and at different levels, and included miners working to extract coal, and engineers working to fix machinery. At 5.20am there was an explosion that shook the entire mine. The blast was so powerful that it was felt on the surface, even great distances away. A clerk at a motel 19 kilometers or 12 miles away reported feeling the ground shake beneath him as the explosion took place. Many local residents were familiar with the mine and could all too accurately guess what the shaking of the ground might mean. Dozens of people converged on the mine to offer what help they could. By the time they arrived, however, they were met with the sight of a rapidly spreading fire. Smoke and flames shot 46 metres or 150 feet into the air from the main entrance to the mine. Despite this terrifying sight, some workers were still able to walk out of the mine unscathed. 
the network of tunnels was so huge that some workers on the east side were oblivious to the blast, and continued to work for half an hour after the explosion. By 6am, 13 miners had realised something was amiss and left the mine safely of their own accord. By 9am, there were hundreds of rescuers on site, but the fire was still so fierce and the possibility of secondary explosions so high that there was little they could do. Some surviving miners were identified at the bottom of a relatively new air shaft. A telephone was dropped down to them so that they could communicate, along with gas masks to allow them to breathe in the smoky, dusty, low oxygen environment at the base of the shaft. A local construction project provided a crane and bucket to the rescue effort, which was lowered down, only for it to emerge that the cable was very slightly too short to reach the trapped miners. A new cable was acquired, and at around 10am, eight miners were ferried in twos and threes to the surface. Five of them were barely conscious, having breathed in carbon monoxide or sustained other injuries. All, however, would go on to survive. Shortly after this, though, another explosion ripped through the mine, as the fire reached another pocket of explosive methane gas. Several more explosions would follow over the next few hours. By this point, the media had descended on the site and the families of the miners had congregated there too, desperate for some news. As journalist Joe Laufer reported from the scene, mothers and wives fill the aisles of the company store and gather along the highway, some crying, some expressionless, wondering what is happening below the surface. Mine officials are preparing to begin rescue operations. They have held out some hope, but will not comment on the chances of survival for any of the men. The question of what was happening below the surface was an impossible one to answer. The fire continued to rage uncontrollably. As the days passed, it showed no signs of relenting, and the hopes of finding any more survivors decreased. Holes were drilled to take air samples from inside the mine, and it was confirmed that the air simply was not breathable. On the 29th of November, nine days after the initial explosion, it was decided that the only way to stop the fire would be to seal the mine shut, cutting off the oxygen supply. In doing so, any last tenuous hope of more survivors would also be extinguished but there was little other choice. In total, 78 miners were killed in the disaster. Ten months passed after the explosion before the mine was unsealed so that attempts could be made to recover the bodies of the dead. These attempts went on for many years, but despite great efforts, 19 bodies were never recovered. Most people in positions of power defended the mining company, noting that gas explosions were an inherent risk of mining. Assistant Secretary of the Interior, J. Cordell Moore, said, The company here has done all in its power to make this a safe mine. Unfortunately, we don't understand why these things happen, but they do happen. Governor Hewlett Smith also commented that, We must recognise that this is a hazardous business and what has occurred here is one of the hazards of being a miner. The disaster did spur some positive change. Congressman Ken Heckler fought for the miners, paying for hundreds of workers and widows to protest in Washington. In early 1969, 40,000 West Virginia coal miners staged a wildcat strike, demanding better, safer working conditions. That same year, the Coal Mine Safety and Health Act was passed by Congress, which increased the number of mine inspections and put more responsibility on companies to adhere to safety rules, imposing fines and criminal penalties for violations. While this progress was of some comfort to those who had lost loved ones in the Farmington mine disaster, some fundamental questions still remained unanswered. They wanted to know what had caused the explosion and who might be responsible. 
In 2014, families asked the US Court of Appeals to reinstate a wrongful death lawsuit after some new evidence was uncovered. A retired federal mine inspector, Larry Lane, wrote in a sworn affidavit that he had been told by a mine electrician that the alarm on a ventilation fan had been turned off by the mine's head electrician on the day of the disaster. The alarm would have made workers aware that the ventilation fan was not functioning, and that therefore dangerous gases could be building up. If this was true, the company was directly responsible for the disaster. Some families pressed for further action, but in 2017 a federal judge threw out the case, saying the suit, brought 46 years after the explosion, is late by more than 44 years. The Farmington mine disaster prompted some positive change for the mining industry, and mining certainly became a much safer profession as a result. But in this case, the direct cause of this specific disaster was never fully explored. A ceremony is held every year to commemorate the 78 miners that lost their lives in the explosion. A large stone memorial stands atop the site of the Number 9 mine, etched with the names of the miners that were killed that day, with marks next to those whose bodies were never found. <laughs>